Hello everyone. So one of my viewers recently sent me an email asking for help with a particular physics problem. It's the problem that you see on the screen here. Now I hadn't come across this problem before. I found it quite interesting. So I have solved it and I thought I would share it with you all. So what we start with in this problem is a ball spinning at high angular velocity. So the ball is rotating about a horizontal axis that passes through its center of mass. And we drop this ball from rest so that it falls a height h down to the ground. Uh, then there are going to be some energy losses due to the collision with the ground and it's going to bounce back up, reach a maximum height of kh, where k is this dimensionless parameter less than 1. Now it's going to be rough ground, the coefficient of friction between the ball and the ground is mu, and because the ball is spinning against rough ground there is going to be a frictional force which is going to set the ball in motion horizontally as well, hence the parabolic trajectory of the ball when it bounces. So the question is, assuming that the ball is skidding during its entire period of contact with the ground, we have to find the value d that I've labeled on the diagram, the horizontal distance between the first and second impacts with the ground. By this word skidding, I basically just mean spinning in place like the wheel of a car trying to drive on very, very slippery ice or something, as opposed to rolling. And that is in fact why I specified in the first sentence of the problem um, that the ball is spinning with a high angular velocity. Uh, we're assuming that it's spinning quickly enough that it just is always skidding and, and doesn't start rolling at any point. So I've summarized all that information on the diagram that I've sketched out here, and I've just drawn the ball at three successive times t0, t1, and t2. So let's start working our way through this, and it's clear that a very, very important thing to consider in this problem is going to be friction. So we're going to focus our attention on the frictional force acting on the ball while it's in contact with the ground um, to start with. And the key here is to note that the ball is skidding all the time while it's in contact with the ground. So I'm first just going to write that down. Because the ball is skidding, um, that means there is constantly a relative motion between the surface of the ball and the ground itself. So because the ball is sort of scraping against the ground, the friction has already reached its maximum possible value, um, meaning that the friction is equal to the coefficient of friction mu multiplied by the normal contact force. Now this might seem like an obvious thing to write down, but remember that f is not always equal to mu n, right? In general, f is less than or equal to mu n. It really is the fact that there's relative motion between the surface of the ball and the ground that means um, we can say the friction has reached its maximum value. I just want to point out here that if you were to spin the ball even faster, you would be increasing its initial angular velocity, but because the friction has already reached its maximum possible value, you wouldn't be making the friction any bigger, and therefore you wouldn't be changing the trajectory of the ball um, after its bounce. And therefore, our solution is not going to depend on the initial angular velocity, which may be a little bit surprising. So if you want to calculate the size of the frictional force, we will first need to know the size of the normal contact force. So we can do that simply by uh, applying Newton's second law um, to the ball during the time that it's in contact with the ground. So the forces acting on the ball are uh, the normal contact force acting upwards and the weight acting downwards, meaning the resultant upwards force um, is n, the normal contact force, minus the weight, um, which we're just going to call mg. And Newton's second law tells us that that resultant force is equal to the rate of change of momentum in the vertical direction. Um, so I'm going to set that equal to delta um, py, the y component, vertical component of the momentum, um, divided by delta t. Now we can write out this delta py term more explicitly if we define a couple of velocities on our diagram. So let's say at the instant just before the ball comes into contact with the ground for the first time, it's moving downwards with a speed of u, um, and then just after it's left the ground, uh, it's then going upwards with a vertical component of velocity of v. Of course, because of that horizontal frictional force, it's also acquired a horizontal component of velocity um, after it's bounced, and so we may as well also define the horizontal component of the velocity after the bounce um, to be w. So going back to this delta py by delta t, uh, the change in momentum is just going to be mv minus minus mu, um, which is the same as m brackets uh, v plus u, and then we're going to divide that by delta t, where the interpretation of that delta t is the length of time um, that the ball remains in contact with the ground. So let's see if we can express u and v in terms of the originally specified parameters of the problem. Um, because the ball is basically a projectile, both before and after the 
bounce, we can just apply the Suvat equations. So we're going to use the equation v squared equals u squared plus 2as. Um, if we apply that to the initial stage of the motion, where it's just falling downwards in a straight vertical line, um, you get u squared equals 0 squared plus 2gh, because the initial velocity is uh, 0, and the final velocity here is u. And then we rearrange that to find that u is just root of 2gh. Let's do the equivalent thing for the post bounce motion um, in the vertical direction, v squared equals u squared plus 2as. Well now the uh, final velocity squared um, is 0 squared because we're looking at the point um, where the ball has reached its maximum height right at the top of that trajectory. Uh, the initial vertical speed is v, so it's v squared. It's accelerating downwards so we need a minus sign um, and it's going to be 2 uh, times g times the distance traveled, which is kh now, um, and then that rearranges in much the same way to v equals the square root of 2g kh, and it's also worth noting that that's the same as just u multiplied by root k. What that tells you, by the way, is that the square root of k is just the coefficient of restitution between the ball and the ground. So let's put all these results together and try and come up with an expression for the frictional force f. Um, so f is mu times the normal contact force, so we're going to start with a mu. Um, the normal contact force is, remember, this plus mg, we've got to move that mg to the other side. Um, so we're going to have m into uh, v plus u. Um, we can take out a common factor of root 2gh. Um, then we just get a 1 in our brackets from the uh, u term, and then we get a plus root k from the v term, because remember we said v was just u times root k. And then we need to divide that whole thing by the time of contact, delta t. Uh, then don't forget we've got to mute, move that mg term over as well, so we have to add on mu um, mg. What we want to do is relate that frictional force to the horizontal component of the velocity after the bounce, which is w, and we can do that by applying Newton's second law again, but this time in the horizontal direction. So we're going to set that whole thing to the rate of change of horizontal momentum, which is delta px um, by delta t, but the change in horizontal momentum um, is just m times w minus zero, because there was no horizontal momentum to start with, and that of course has to be divided by delta t. So then the resulting equation can be solved quite straightforwardly for w. Um, so all we have to do is notice that there's a common factor of m, the mass of the particle, uh, in all of the terms, so we're going to cancel that and that and that, and therefore our final answer is not going to depend on the mass of the particle. Um, hence why I didn't specify it in the original problem statement. Um, and, but anyway, then all we need to do is multiply by delta t to get rid of the fraction, and you're going to be left with w equals mu root 2gh uh, into 1 plus root k. And then you've got this, um, the weight term is going to become mu g delta t. The only slight problem with this is that we don't know what delta t is, right? It's the amount of time that the ball spends in contact with the ground, but without further information such as for example, the material that the ball is made from, um, we just don't know how long it spends in contact with the ground. And even if you did know the material it was made from, it would be a pretty advanced calculation. But if you just sort of visualize the scenario in this problem happening in real life, for a typical ball, it's going to spend a very, very short time in contact with the ground. So what we're going to do is neglect this mu g delta t term and say that it's much smaller than the other term, um, which will allow us to come up with a, an actual solution to our problem. So I've just had to clear some space, but I've summarized the two main results um, from what we've done so far, which is the uh, vertical and horizontal components of the velocity just after the ball has bounced, v and w. So at this point, the ball just behaves like a projectile, and we're going to treat the horizontal and vertical components of the motion separately, as we usually do. And let's think about the um, horizontal component first, because it's simpler, because there are no horizontal forces acting on the ball during the projectile part of its motion. Um, therefore, what we can just do is use speed equals distance over time, because the speed is constant. Um, the time involved here uh, is basically going to be t2 minus t1, as marked on the diagram. So the time um, at which the ball hits the ground for the second time, minus the time um, when the ball first comes into contact with the ground. Uh, for ease of notation, let's just define that time difference to be capital T. So that's basically the time of flight of the projectile, and time is distance over speed. In a horizontal direction, that means capital T 
is d divided by w. Now in the vertical direction there is weight acting and therefore we have to use our SUVAT equations um, because there's acceleration, right? So we are going to use the equation s equals ut plus half at squared and we'll just plug in uh, the values that are appropriate for the projectile part of the motion. Now s is going to be zero because we care about uh, the particular instant when the ball comes back into contact with the ground. So overall it hasn't moved anywhere vertically, so we're going to make the left-hand side of the equation zero. Um, our ut term um, is really going to be v times t because the notation we've used has uh, v as the initial vertical um, velocity. And then we have to subtract off half g t squared minus because it's accelerating downwards. Um, and then we can solve this by factorizing um, a t out because it's a quadratic equation. Right? You take out t and then you get v minus a half g t. Now there are two solutions to this equation of course. One of them is just t equals zero but that's the uninteresting solution which just means well the particle has traveled zero distance at zero time. So we are going to specifically look for the solution where t is bigger than zero which implies the bracketed term is zero and therefore v equals a half uh, g t. And we have an expression for v Remember that was root 2gkh, and we have an expression for capital T, um, which was d over w, and we've also got our expression for w. So all we have to do is substitute a bunch of equations into v equals a half gt. So the left-hand side, which is just v, is of course going to become the square root of 2gkh. The right-hand side, we'll keep our half g there. Then we're going to have a big fraction because it's distance over speed. So the numerator is of course just d. Um, the denominator is w. So what I can do is just copy and paste this expression for w that we got earlier. So now we've made an equation um, that we can solve for d. So we're going to write down d equals, first thing we are going to do is multiply by 2 over g to remove the g over 2 factor. So let's put 2 over g. Um, then you're going to multiply by this denominator to move the fraction. So you're going to get a factor of mu. Then some square roots are going to cancel out. You've got root 2gkh multiplied by root 2gh. That's going to turn into 2gh, but the k is still under the square root. And then in the brackets, you've got 1 plus root k. And finally, the g's cancel and leave you with 4 mu h k into 1 plus root k. A couple of things to say about this result. First of all, notice that mu and k are both dimensionless parameters, and so um, because it's directly proportional to h, that expression overall, it has dimensions of length as it should do because d is a distance. In terms of how it depends on h and k, well it's directly proportional to h, meaning that if you drop it from uh, twice the height, then it's going to go twice as far horizontally, which makes a lot of intuitive sense. Um, the k-dependence, uh, I don't have like an intuitive explanation for why it specifically depends on root k and then 1 plus root k, but do notice that the bigger k gets, um, the bigger the horizontal distance gets, which means if it bounces more vertically, it also bounces more horizontally. Now that makes a lot of sense because if it bounces more vertically, there must have been a bigger normal contact force to produce that bigger bounce. Um, and if there's a bigger normal contact force, there's also a bigger frictional force, which gives it a bigger um, component of horizontal velocity. So um, the dependence on both H and K makes physical sense. Again, as I mentioned earlier, probably the most surprising thing about this is it doesn't explicitly depend on the angular velocity. It kind of depends on the angular velocity in the sense that the angular velocity has to be high enough that it keeps skidding and doesn't start rolling while it's in contact with the ground. But once you've reached that threshold, um, the faster you spin it, uh, you, you can't make the friction any bigger and therefore omega doesn't appear in our result. Well, we've solved it. That's all for now. Hope you've enjoyed and I will see you next time.